All right. Welcome everyone to our event today. My name is Carrie Hansen. I am the Vice President of SOCAP. We're really excited to host this event in partnership with um, TIP and all of our esteemed authors and guests today. Not only is this our first book launch party, virtually or otherwise, um, but this is also a first in terms of um, being an event that's submitted through our SOCAP community platform, which is where we are, um, it's user-generated content, and we are bringing your voices forward, highlighting the important topics that you are working on um, and that we need to work on together and creating space for more collective action. Um, and so I am delighted as part of uh, the, our next steps to turn the mic not only over to you as the community, but to turn the mic over to Monique Aiken, Managing Director um, with TIP. And she is going to get us all rolling for the rest of our event. Please chat your comments, questions, ideas, what you're loving hearing um, in the chat feature. You are all uh, muted as you're coming in, um, but then we will have space and time for Q&A later. But Monique, over to you. Thanks, Carrie, and thanks to everyone for being here to celebrate the launch of these two frontier pushing books, 21st Century Investing, Directing Financial Strategies to Drive Systems Change, and Moving Beyond Modern Portfolio Theory, Investing That Matters. Over the next hour or so that we're together, we'll hear from Steve Persanti, founder and senior editor of Barrett Kohler, the publisher of Bill and Steve's book. Then we'll hear from Bill, president of TIP, who'll provide a high level overview of the themes from his and Steve's book, then Jim Howley, Senior ESG Advisor at True Value Labs, a fact set company, and Professor Emeritus of the School of Business, um, sorry, School of Economics and Business at St. Mary's College of California, will share a synopsis of moving beyond portfolio theory, his and John McCombs' book. John is the managing director of Sinclair Capital. We'll then be joined by three leaders in our sector to share their hot takes or warm takes or cold takes, I'm not sure, but there'll be takes um, who, uh, and then they'll be joined in conversation with Jim, John and Bill. Lisa Davis, Executive Director of Impact Investing at JM Real Estate. Kelly Major Green, Institutional Consultant at Greystone. Renee Manley, Deputy Director, C Strategic Initiatives Department at Service Employees International Union and Deputy Trustee at SEIU Pension. Finally, we'll have Q&A with all of you to follow. And as Carrie said, please share your questions and comments in the chat and we'll try to get to as many of them as we can. So thanks again for coming. And with that, I'll turn it over to Steve Persenti for a few opening remarks. Thank you. Um, I'm, uh, it has been a great privilege uh, to serve as the editor, uh, working with uh, Bill and Steve on this book. Um, I have been a business book editor for 39 years. Um, so I'm a little bit ancient in, in this arena. Um, and during those 39 years, I have worked on many, many hundreds of, of books. Um, and so I have, I have a lot of experience in this realm. I, I may be the most experienced business book editor in the country. And I can say um, in, in complete uh, honesty, that this is one of the most important books that I've worked on uh, during these 39 years, and gauged by um, the importance of the book, the potential impact of the book, how much of a difference this book could make in the world, uh, how much this could change, it, it, it could affect the flow of billions and maybe even trillions of dollars uh, of investment over time as people start uh, to um, put into practice the, the ideas, the concepts, the messages in this book. There, there aren't very many books that, that, you, that, that, that one has the privilege of working on that could have such a far-reaching impact, but this is one of them. And of course, that all depends upon um, whether uh, people uh, actually uh, uh, pick up the book and read it and, and, and apply the ideas. But uh, this group here, that's on this call today is going to have a very big impact on that. You, you are what we call pass alongers or the first adopters or the people that will, will um, uh, first others to get them excited about the book. And, and so you're, you're going to have an outsized impact on uh, what's the trajectory of this book and, and how much does it make a difference? Um, I will say that, that um, it, it was also just a great privilege to work with Bill and Steve on this book. Um, they were, 
tremendous as authors. Um, I threw everything at them, all the all the tricks and that I had in terms of giving them a hard time, uh, putting them uh, through the ringer of of uh, because the, the subject matter is is very complex. I mean, any, anytime you're talking about systems change, but by definition, systems change is enormously complex, and and. Uh, and then you bring in financial change. I mean, I mean, kind of everything was going against it in terms of writing a, a readable book, uh, given the systems focus, given the financial focus, given the, the, this being so avant-garde, uh, being looking forward. It, it, everything was stacked against the authors. And so I, um, we, we worked round after round after round uh, of refining the concepts. And, and they... Bill is, is laughing here because he knows he really was put through the grinder yeah. on, on this. Um, but but they 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 kept coming back for more and coming back for more, and we kept refining it, refining it, and and so I I think they they they're champions. They they did a tremendous job, Bill and Steve together, and and so even though this this is you know i wouldn't say the book is an easy book uh, but but it's about as as clear straightforward simple as one could possibly make it given the 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 uh the importance and the complexity of the material um so i i consider the book to be a great accomplishment and and uh and i'm 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 thrilled uh that Bert kohler is, is able to publish it it's a great fit with our list um i think it's going to make a huge difference in the world I will stop there. And I, I should mention also, I'm going to have to jump off after a while. I actually have another event. Another one of our authors is having a, a, a similar event at the same time. So, so uh, Bill and Steve got first, uh, first <laughs> preference, but I have to jump to another one after a little while. Well, thank you for joining us, Steve. And honestly, we're collectively humbled by those words. I think um, the path ahead of us is a uh, Good work, um, but hard work. And thank you for making a readable book, Steve. <laughs> but Bill, you're up and please share us a little bit more about, about what 21st Century has to say. Yeah, so just first a big thank you to Carrie for hosting us and, um, and obviously to Steve for literally every gray hair that I now have in my head <laughs> that came through in the last 18 months. So Steve ended with a statement. I wanna start with a question. So what are the biggest threats to an investor's portfolio these days? Climate change impacts all investors across all asset classes. Income inequality threatens to polarize politics, paralyze governments, destabilize democracies, and lead to nationalistic populism, trade wars, and even geopolitical conflicts. Pandemics disrupt economic models and require heroic efforts by governments and private enterprise to keep system-wide collapse at bay. These are the 21st century's fundamentally destabilizing, new and different social and environmental challenges. They are global. They have tipping points that once passed cannot be reversed. They are systemic risks in a highly interconnected and complex world. And they threaten long-term investment across all asset classes in ways that traditional risk management cannot cope with. All of which leads to the $200 trillion question, how are investors supposed to act on these systemic risks? Tip's new book out today by myself and Steve Leidenberg on 21st century investing, redirecting financial strategies to drive systems change provides an answer. The book, which lays out a roadmap for how investors can shift their investment practices to meet the challenges of our modern times is based on the work Steve and I have been doing for the past six years with our team at Tip, a consulting services and applied research firm. The big idea at the center of the book and our work generally is that investors need to better understand and act on the big picture context of their investments and the feedback loops between their investments and the planet's overarching systems that make profitable investment opportunities possible. We at TIP have coined the term system level investing to describe this challenge. Now to navigate this bumpy terrain, 21st century investing essentially provides the what, why, and how of system level investment what it means to manage system level risks and rewards, why it is imperative to do so now, and how to integrate this new way of thinking into current practice. The six key elements of that process are the same for all investors. Set goals, decide where to focus, allocate assets, apply investment tools, leverage advanced techniques, and evaluate results. For each step along the way, we illustrate the need for and benefits of incorporating a system level perspective. Take an issue like income inequality, for instance. System level investors ask not only how 
they can manage the risks posed by these systemic issue, by the systemic issue for this or that portfolio, but what initiatives they can take that will create fundamental change in the system itself that has generated growing income inequality. They look for leverage points within the current system that will drive change. This means, for example, advocating for setting of a minimum wage, not just by one firm, but in a locality, state, or nation. The same can be said for other key leverage points, such as diversity, unions and workers' rights, taxes and safety. They want to see to it that industry standards are set, voluntary if necessary, regulatory if possible, and demand that government enforce the laws and regulations already on the books. They recognize that to make system level change happen, one voice is not enough. System level investors join with their peers to amplify their message on the importance of addressing income inequality and increase their influence. So put another way, those making progress adopt tactics such as investing in portfolios entirely targeted or heavily weighted towards social and environmental solutions and advocate for public policies that reduce systemic risks and advance the health and resilience of crucial systems. They engage at industry levels to set standards and norms. They collaborate with others to amplify their influence and they set clear goals for system level, not simply portfolio related progress and report on how they're working to achieve these goals. What these examples show is that it's time for a big leap, a really big leap into the future with a new era of investing. As we describe in the book, doing so is not only what investment should be, but what it must be if the financial community is to do its part to avoid a multiplicity of collapses and crises that will threaten our complex world in the coming decades and take advantage of the opportunities that addressing these challenges head on at a fundamental level can generate not only for themselves, but for all investors. And rest assured, the investment community is catching on to the importance of this idea. Awareness of systemic issues and the urgency needed to address them is increasingly reflected in the heightened concern by investors for responsibility for the stewardship of their assets, one that policymakers and those concerned with corporate governance are gradually integrating the language of systemic risks into. For example, in the UK Stewardship Code 2020, Principle 4 directs its asset owners and managers to identify and respond to market-wide and systemic risks to promote a well-functioning financial system. The CFA Institute, the Global Association of Investment Professionals, has also echoed this sentiment. In a recent report acknowledging the multiple, multiple fa interconnected factors that drive the investment ecosystem, CFA advised readers to move beyond traditional ESG practices and into system level thinking. Today, investors of all stripes have the opportunity to become part of this important transition and early adopters of a transformational movement. Steve and I have been on this journey together for nearly six years and there are many more steps for us to take. TIP has a number of projects in the works that build on the book and that will make the journey easier for other investors. Chief among them is a turnkey program that TIP will soon launch that will enable investors to implement internal processes geared towards system level investing. This initiative will provide investors with a resource for navigating the complications of building a system level investing knowledge base and practice, identifying effective actions, partners and initiatives, measuring and reporting on achievements, keeping up to date on global developments and key aspects of public policy, industry trends and innovative initiatives, and identifying future trends. So as you walk with us down this path, please share the good and the bad, the simple and the complex in your transition to system level investing. And for those not yet on this path to a new normal for investing practice, we welcome you to join us. You know, I can't help but smile at the incredible group of panelists, authors, colleagues and attendees that have joined us today. To think this whole thing started six years ago at a Panera Bread in downtown Boston over some pastries. My co-author and dear friend Steve and I had met to discuss a report I had written, a report I thought was superb, and Steve thought was, and I quote, fine. Now Steve has always been one for brevity, and I like to think that that's why he didn't overpraise my work. But the real reason was Steve had already been working on the idea of system level investing, and my report missed that mark. He would explain this idea to me that day, and I would decide to join him in building a company around it. Six years later, I'm still in awe by how far we have come and the potential of where we can be another six years from now. So I can't help but smile because we are on the road to systemic change, because we know how to get there, because we have met some remarkable people along the way, because Steve and I had that crucial meeting in that Panera all those years ago, and because we just released a book that can help push the industry forward 
a book Steve describes as slightly better than five. Thank you guys for having us. Thank you, Bill. Um, are you a croissant guy or more of a pan a raison? Uh, chocolate croissant all the way, come on. Okay, very good. Um, and thanks for that. And Jim, Jim, if you could uh, unmute yourself and you know share some thoughts about your and John's book. Sure, thank you all for organizing this. Um, the uh, Bill and Steve's book and ours, we did not plan together, nor did we consult with our publishers to have them published two and a half weeks apart. But nevertheless, it is a fortuitous coincidence, I think. And I think actually it has meaning aside from the chance element of it. Uh, and the meaning is at least twofold, that uh, John and I uh, have long known both Bill and Steve and we've all had conversations. That said, these were, I think, somewhat parallel track books. And ours, in a sense, is a background, I think, to Bill and Steve's. And our book is um, obviously on modern portfolio theory. Um, and the notion very quickly is that uh, the MPT revolution, which in some ways began in 1952 with Harry Markowitz's uh, famous uh, um, article, um, but actually got going in a practical sense in the 80s for a host of reasons, has really outlived its, uh, its age and not its usefulness, but as sort of a totality of complete way of investing and thinking about investing, it's time to move beyond it. And our book is an attempt to, uh, to do that. The purpose is not a modest one. The goal actually is to redefine what investment is and what its true North Star should be. And it's time to reintegrate finance with a broader economy and society. And in that sense also very much has the kind of systemic outlook that, um, that Bill and Steve's book does. There's no way I'm going to take uh, approximately seven minutes more and summarize the book. That is not something I'm gonna try. So what I'm gonna try to do is highlight a couple of the, uh, what we think are some of the key elements of the book. Um, one of the ones we talk about is a major paradox we call the MPT paradox. And I think the analogy is to a one-way valve. It lets air or water in one side and compresses it or expands it and, and pushes it out on the other side. And what that means is that essentially built into the MPT worldview is that markets affect or can affect your investments, but that you cannot affect the overall market. And so the NPT focuses on what matters to investors least. That is to say, you can't control beta. You can, or at least think you can, control the search for alpha. Uh, what matters least is that alpha, or what we call the alpha-beta spectrum, is that beta swamps alpha in terms of determining uh, uh, returns. And so that the issue then really becomes the how risk management is defined in MPT and how we attempt to essentially redefine it, I would say expand it. It's not that we're throwing the MPT baby out with the bathwater, but the baby has grown, so to speak, and outgrown the little tub that the water was in when the baby was an infant. So if you look at MPT in terms of its risk target, it's idiosyncratic risk. Um, if you look at the technique, it's clearly diversification. And it is looking at, in that sense, the least mean variance of the portfolio along an efficient frontier, or in some cases, multiple efficient frontiers. The playing field is, or are the capital markets. And the, fo the focus clearly is on volatility but not necessarily, or indeed not at all, on the causes of volatility. We talk about something we call the third stage of corporate governance. Um, we've also talked about that as beta activism, a term that has been picked up a lot, and we're very pleased with that. I'm, I'm not sure we coined it. We thought we coined it, but perhaps not. But we have no proprietary um, ownership of the term at all. Um, 
And um, at, at the very end, if I have time, I'll give some examples, though I think they fit in very much to what Bill talked about in terms of what beta activism is. So that to take the valve analogy, really what we have here is a two-way valve. It's got at least two inputs and one outcome. And um, that's really a very, very different way of looking at, at, at investments. So to follow through for a minute on what I talked about, it targets risk, but the risk it targets is systemic risk, is systematic risk, excuse me. That is risk that affects the whole portfolio or at least a very, very large chunk of it. And that is very much related to system risk, the kind of risk that Bill talked about, issue of, of gender and ethnic and racial inequality and income inequalities, issue of climate change, issues of biodiversity, things that affect the core functioning of the economy, the society, and therefore of the financial markets. The risk technique is to mitigate risk around social, environmental, and financial risk beyond the structure of the investment portfolio that you control, or indeed, perhaps think you control. The playing field in that regards is not simply the capital markets, but it's the broader economy and society, and that has multiple implications. The goal is improved market, uh, market risk and risk return of, of profits, but it has a different way of looking uh, at that than in a narrower and self-defined or self-constrained internalized MPT view of the world, which is strictly constrained. And the focus, therefore, is really between issues of volatility, as MPT sees them, but other forms of market risk in the broader political economy. And the book is an attempt to play that out in terms of examples um, and, uh, and how this came to be. We focused a lot on issues of externalities. We focused a lot on a collection of, uh, of classical uh, of, um, economists, um, three of whom won Nobel Prizes, two of whom didn't because they, were, they died too early, uh, starting with Smith, and uh, talk about each in their own very radically different ways. What was important to them was the relationship between markets and the broader uh, and the broader political economy, and, and in some cases, financial markets as well. And so we essentially try to bring economics in a broad sense back in. And we feel that in general, finance obviously had its origins in economics, but has, especially in its US version, starting from the, the 50s on, has really shot off in its, in its own direction. And in that sense, the, the, uh, the culmination of that has been MPT, but it has been, um, in, again, in a very isolated way, which has done, in our view, both significant damage by going on as usual. Um, there are a number of elements of this. Let me just mention one obvious one, that when MPT, even in the 80s, but certainly when it was theoretically conceived and began its development in the, in the 1950s, the capital markets were extraordinarily decentralized. In the US, 92% were owned of assets and equities were owned by individuals, 8% by institutions. It's close to done a complete flip by now so that you have highly concentrated markets and everybody, more or less, is using a similar analytic technique. And that's a problem. That is, MPT has been unbelievably successful, but has now not accounted for the problems of its own success. And our book attempts to address that. So that's a very quick, not a rundown of the book, but a couple of highlights and perhaps some of the context. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. And I think we'll begin at the beginning with our discussants, Lisa, Kelly, and Renee. And I'd just love to hear a high level response from each of you on the concepts that Bill and Jim outlined and the utility of them in, uh, broadly in your own work. So perhaps, Renee, maybe we'll begin with you and then we'll turn to Lisa and then Kelly. Yes, yeah, so well, first of all, I wanna thank um, SOCAP for, and the authors for inviting me to be a part of this discussion. 
today. You know, um, I think I'm excited about the theories um, that both books raise, um, both in my work with um, institutional investors and trustees and in my own role as a trustee. You know, we see that um, in our dialogues with investors that they want to be to be able to address these issues um, in a more systematic and holistic way. And they often are, um, feel like they're prohibited from doing so, um, you know, from, you know, kind of the institutional um, kind of traditional corporate governance uh, viewpoints. And I think this provides and kind of an alternative theory that supports, um, you know, their role um, in, in thinking about this and, and supports it from a, a, a fiduciary standpoint. Um, and I think that's really exciting and I can't wait to, to um, I've already begun to share this with them and I can't wait to um, have them kind of read the books <laughs> and, and, and get their viewpoints on it. So this is really exciting. Thanks Renee. And Alisa, what's your take? Um, thanks, I mean, I agree wholeheartedly with Renee. It's really wonderful to have um, a lot of very uh, specific and well-researched um, uh, conversation to support some of the things that many of us have seen intuitively in our work. And I would like to just take a moment and talk about how I see some of this um, playing out in uh, the sector where uh, I work, which is um, real estate sector. So I work for PGM Real Estate. We're one of the asset management companies of Prudential Financial, and I lead um, a, an impact investing strategy at the firm. And you know, one of the things that has become very clear to me in the last uh, uh, year is that real estate is not the stock market. And so it actually responds and is incorporated into multiple systems uh, that you all speak about in very concrete ways. But to date, because we've looked at it in the aggregate, we have been subject to um, a market bias towards uh, looking at um, how real estate is affected by people with high incomes. So, you know, real estate investment um, uh, and, and portfolio theory with real estate investment is that you invest in industrial, office, residential, but you think about it in terms of where the highest uh, amount of money is spent. So high-end retail, class A apartments. And the reality is that if you bifurcate the sector and look at not just the highest income spending, but spending across um, all incomes and therefore addressing inequality, um, you, you see that we um, have to address things like affordable housing and industrial production uh, and um, essential retail and essential services if we're going to have a healthy sector uh, overall. And we're really living through a time where um, we understand how closely all of these systems are uh, integrated uh, into one another so that when people are struggling in, in terms of um, losing jobs through the pandemic, um, when people are struggling with racial inequality, that's manifest in the physical systems that we all live in, that the whole real estate sector um, suffers. And that in fact, the essential parts of the real estate system, affordable housing and industrial production are the most stable through a time like this. And that runs in many ways counter to um, this uh, uh, seeking alpha kind of approach that um, a lot of traditional real estate investors um, have, have focused on. And so, um, you know, just to conclude, I think uh, there are a lot of things that we can talk about in the real estate sector that are very concrete about how these systems interlock from labor to raw materials, to manufacturing, to um, some of the other sort of societal systems like, uh, you know, race and income. Um, but the one that I'm uh, really interested and focused on right now is uh, the connection between climate change, the climate change system, the climate system and inequality. So look forward to talking more about that. Thanks a lot. Lisa, we deeply appreciate those comments and the practical nature of applying these ideas to your work and your asset class. And we'll just turn to Kelly also for some, some thoughts broadly, how these books are landing with you in, in your realm. Thanks Monique and um, thanks to SOCAP for hosting and Thanks for Tip uh, for inviting me and thanks Jim for writing your book. Um, there are three points that I'd like to cover 
Uh, Grayson Consulting is the institutional consulting business of Morgan Stanley Wealth Management. And so we have a continuum of institutional clients that we work with. And the concepts in the books that um, are most resonant with me at the moment as we're unpacking them, um, first is, you know, the more things change, the more things stay the same, right? Um, the process that uh, Tip laid out, uh, the methodology of setting goals and understanding belief systems, you know, those are, are you know, practic practical steps that we take that we lead our clients through at every level, right? The question is, where are the belief systems sitting today for our clients and where should they be sitting? Uh, and, you know, this book, um, 21st Century, is really challenging where should they be sitting? Uh, and then for our role is to try to figure out how then to implement uh, some of these actions to move down the continuum should a client uh, be so inclined. Uh, the next thought was really about encapsulated in the book about in the books about applying you know kind of old world thoughts to a new world system. Um, the analogy that was used if you would go to a doctor who you know was using fifty year old practices would you turn around and walk out or stay the same and I and I thought that that was really resonant in trying to challenge all of us about the practicality of how some things change and some things stay the same and what things should be changing in our own methodologies. Um, and then the final point that I'll make is really about risk and the definition of risk. And Jim talked about this a lot. In our work, we look at it a lot. We look at risk um, as it is defined or has been defined as those risks that are affectable through the investment process. Uh, and you know, we have been operating under the presumption that market risk is not affectable, right? We've been operating under the assumption that the role of investors is to deal with the things that are uh, manageable within the system or definable. And quite frankly, the role of, of consultants have, have been to create trade-offs between risk and return uh, on a two-pronged axis, and now risk return and impact on a three-pronged axis. And this is really pushing uh, conceptually uh, much further down on that continuum about what risks are actually affectable through different approaches. And I think, you know, many of our thought leaders inside the firm uh, around impact and impact investing have been wrestling with how we deal with discrete pillars uh, of impact based on a client's belief system and structures and how do we push the asset management community to create more products. This is really a conversation that might be um, a new frontier for the consulting business to help to understand by clients and help to shape for clients what their actual theory of change is. So if we have clients who have an interest in gender equality or racial equality, what is the theory of change uh, that they believe in and how does that manifest itself in investing? I know we're gonna talk about this more, but there's a lot of advocacy and approaches and historically that has not been the role in the consulting space, not only not to advocate, but to uh, relinquish the advocacy toolkit in the quiver to others. Uh, and this is really showing the intersectionality between those tools uh, to be more comprehensive. And so it's interesting. I think, you know, kudos to the authors of both books for really challenging the assumptions here that are critical. Um, and, you know, we've seen what managing systemic risks, risks and external shocks can do to the financial markets and the markets, you know, in many cases, many investors will say, well, the market is not the economy. And I think that is what we're being challenged to rethink today, right? Uh, the connectivity between the market, capital markets and the economy and the responsibility as investors in us living within the economy. 
So kudos to everyone and I look forward to continuing the conversation. Thanks, Monique. Thank you, Kelly. And Renee, um, I think you had another thought that you'd like to share before we allow Bill and Jim and John to um, respond. Yeah, I also just wanted to just raise how I felt this resonated for our, our members at SEIU. You know, we represent um, service workers primarily and healthcare workers. Um, and so, um, you know, our average member um, retires with a pension of about $28,000. They're not rich by any means. You know, we are the union who is fighting for a minimum wage increase. Um, and so when we're often engaging with um, either, you know, large institutional investors or corporate players about, you know, where they can play a role. Um, I think we look at these issues from a structural and systemic um, vantage point. Um, and I think, you know, both of these publications really um, provide us with tools. Um, I think that empower our, you know, our, I think our existing arguments, our existing, our existing frameworks. Um, and, I, I, and I think it's important because I think, um, you know, for folks who are used to kind of corporate governance as usual, um, investing as usual, they, they need the new context and new frameworks and, and, and new data points, quite frankly, to help them kind of step out of that box. And I think both of these um, publications help provide that for them. So just wanted to add that. Thanks, Renee. And John, maybe we'll bring you in since uh, you are also one of the co-authors that didn't get a chance to have your seven minutes of airtime, but um, I'd like to hear your responses given what Lisa and Renee and Kelly have shared. Sure, and I also want to thank Gary and Sopek and everyone for inviting us. Um, you know, it's interesting. I think I think you guys nailed it. Um, the, you know, as Renee said, people feel prohibited from dealing with these issues. And in some ways, people think these ideas are radical because, oh my goodness, why don't you just stay in your lane? And, you know, um, I think Kelly would recognize that what MPT does is it's a very efficient vacuum cleaner for extracting the best possible return from the extant marketplace. But that's only six to 25% of your return. If depending on if you're reading, you know, Ibbotson or Brinson or whichever background paper you're getting, systematic risk is much more. And the problem is that the only link to where value is created, where the system systemic risk is being generated, and in this case, risk is bilateral, it's opportunity as well, right? Um, the only place where value is being created is in the real world, and the only link that MPT has to it is price. And price is a pretty thin read to convey all that is going on, right? And, and, and it's, in some ways, MPT, uh, here's a combination you, you've never heard before. MPT is Oscar Wilde's definition of cynical, right? It's something that knows the price of everything and the value of nothing. It also incredibly hyper discounts the future because of this assumption that these risks are not mitigable because they don't yield to the only tool MPT has, which is diversification, and they're not diversifiable. So you have to deal with them at the source in the real world. And so this feels very radical that we're not staying in our lane and that we've all grown up thinking somehow the capital markets are this hermetically sealed mathematical calculation away from the real world. But really what we're doing is we're bringing back a very old idea and it's MPT that was radical in, and the current way of investing that's radical in saying, no, you know, you don't have to consider the real world. Lisa pointed out that in real estate, you have to consider it all the time, you know, occupancy rates in you know, different sectors. And what we need to do is take a step back and say, if we are going to fulfill the twin purposes of investing, which are to create the best risk adjusted return for investors, which is not an alpha risk adjusted return, it's a total risk adjusted return. Right? If you're up, if you're down eight when the market's down 10, 
great alpha risk and adjusted return. You still got 92 cents on the dollar to retire on, right? And to intermediate capital to where it's societally useful, you have to realize all investments have impact. There are feedback groups, as Bill said, and Bill and Steve have been pounding this for six years correctly. There are these feedback loops between the capital markets and the real world. And if you want to improve the return of the markets, you've got to deal with the real world systems. So I think um, these two books fit great together. I call Steve and, and Bill's book, The How, How to Do It, and our book, The Why, Why You Should Be Doing It. So, and they overlap, obviously. They're not just how and we're not just why, but primarily um, the how and the why. Thank, again, thank you for having me. Before we get into some more specificity with respect to how you might think about application and applicability and what are the rules that potentially prevent folks from implementing some of these ideas, Renee, Kelly, and Lisa will go to you in a second. But Bill, do you want to just respond to some of what you've heard as well momentarily? Yeah, absolutely. So so I, I want to thank John for, so if Steve Prasanti is responsible for half the gray hair that's on my head, John McCormick is responsible for the other half because he was one of the early supporters of TIP and, um, and all, a lot of the ideas are, are definitely attributable to him as well. Um, I want to just point out something with the folks that we invited to be discussing here, and obviously with Jim and John joining us, is what you're seeing is it kind of speaks to this kind of mosaic of activity that has to occur and a mosaic of thinking that has to occur. So what you have is you have Jim and John who taking years of experience are directly challenging MPT and the boundaries of it. Um, you have an asset owner in Renee Manley who is struggling with thinking through. It's like, what is the, what, what are the many ways that as an asset owner, you can use your influence to exert this kind of change? Um, and, and, and the struggles and opportunities of actually kind of operating through those various windows. Um, you have a manager in Lisa who is looking at a particular asset class and kind of understanding the functional utility of that asset class. And, and the real the kind of purpose it was initially designed to affect in society. Um, that's huge. And, and Prudential's long work and kind of being a little bit place-based and kind of the different complexity of investments that go into that. That's another example of a kind of system, a couple of system level strategies that we talk about. And then finally, you have Kelly, who brings in this kind of OCIO perspective, right? And she focused in on beliefs a lot and kind of how do you help the client, you know, articulate this better and start to think about this more holistically. Um, and I think that was really important for one of the things that we wanted to kind of demonstrate here was that this really is, it's not just about what big institutional asset owners can and should do. It's really about what that entire ecosystem of players needs to be doing to really be able to move us along collectively. Because at the end of the day, the only way, and we say this so often, the only way we're gonna to get to systems change is through collective action. Um, so it's gonna take everybody kind of seeing their own way into this. Um, so hopefully that's apparent with everybody listening in. So I just thank everybody for the comments and can't wait to hear more. Yeah, and to get more specific, I think, is where we're going to go next. And we'll begin with you, Lisa, then we'll turn to Kelly and then Renee. When we talk about how this might be applied in your own work, in your own sector, um, what is, is there anything in specific that you think um, is the messaging that you want to advance, particularly for folks like you who look like you, as Bill just described, kind of the very distinct roles that each of you have in, in the community? Lisa, we'll go with you first. Yeah. I mean, as, as owners, as, as I start where I started, where as owners of real estate, um, we're firmly embedded in, in all of these systems and, and also, you know, so much subject to a lot of the um, pitfalls of modern portfolio theory. So as I think about how, how we advance change um, in, in real estate and, and sort of, I think of real estate as, if you will, the social production of, you know, it's the social manifestation in, 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 in the built environment. Um, I think there's two, two things um, that are critical, one internal and one external. And the external one is to really have big investors asking these questions. Our investors, our, our largest investors, our pension funds, um, uh, public and private pension funds like Renee, but increasingly they're also private wealth investors. And so to have um, large investors like those asking these questions of us, I think pushes us to go further. And then, you know, as an asset owner and allocator, I also think that it's important that we look internally, not just about our investment selection, 
but also about how we manage these investments. Like that's really in real estate, how we impact people's lives. When we own real estate, when we operate real estate, um, how are we affecting people's lives and how are we thinking about this, not just the individual properties, but these, the systems that affect people's lives and how we interact with those. So those are, you know, the systems of labor, the systems of, um, you know, raw materials production, uh, the systems of industry, as well as things like transportation and environment and, and environmental justice. And those are things internally that um, for me, I'm always thinking about where do we find the nexus of um, improving those systems, improving the outcomes for people in those systems, uh, but um, also um, generating the kinds of um, returns and performance of the investment um, across the market cycle that our investors expect. Yeah, Monique, I think you wanted me to go yes. next. I'll jump, I'll jump in. Go ahead. Um, yes, yeah, there, there are um, three things that um, really to get practical about this that I think are, are takeaways. The first is, we talked about this, large asset owners having catalytic investment uh, in, their, in their allocations that really allow them to push the envelope uh, in terms of uh, making uh, statements uh, with the capital that they're moving. Um, Bill said that, you know, you can't do this alone. It takes all actors in the system. That there's a very specific intention, and we're seeing this much more with the events of 2020 and, and the events of Sunday. Uh, where people are trying to be much more catalytic in letting their capital speak. Um, our firm has a, a statement that says, cap, you know, capital creates change. And we're seeing that at a, at a much different level. And so for those particular actors, thinking through how the capital is speaking and being catalytic in very particular asset classes, private equity, venture, other things that can be catalytic. But this idea of collective action where not just very large institutional investors, but um, private wealth investors of all sizes can actually collectively move um, a particular idea forward through collective action um, is really critical. And we're seeing a lot of that from our, our individual investors who have interests in wanting to know how to, how to really activate portfolios in a way that aligns to their value and belief systems, right? Uh, and that collective action has actually been resonant in you know, grant making organizations and other organizations that have had to articulate what their values and their outcomes from a community perspective, what they want them to be. And now, you know, these, books uh, and these, these thoughts are, are forcing investors to start to try to articulate that point. And um, quite frankly, it will be uh, organizations uh, like TIP and others who can help facilitate with clients, you know, crystallizing what their beliefs and values are so that they can be incorporated into investments. Um, and finally, I, I have to come back to this issue of risk because we talk about it so much and yet we think we have some control and portfolio construction about how to mitigate risk. We talk a lot about, about risk adjusted returns uh, and we have seen one of the most volatile periods uh, in capital markets in the last uh, you know, 12, month, 12 to 18 months. And to John's point, it does create um, concern and it creates opportunity. And so the question then is, how do we construct uh, actions that will take become opportunities for our clients through risk adjusted returns or through taking advantage of volatility in the capital markets? I mean, it is, it is a concept that is very real uh, and that uh, separates the wheat from the chaff in my business of those who want to take on uh, that kind of detailed construction. Thank you, Kelly. And I will let you um, close out this segment. Um, and we've got about nine minutes left. So I will share what's coming next so that folks can be braced for it. I'm going to ask each of the speakers, everyone who's here, 
your book title for what's next? Bill, I know that probably just gave you PTSD to even ask, but um, you know, it doesn't have to be something that you're really working on, but what would your book be? And I'll, I'll just give a foreshadowing that mine is a children's book title, so you can be expansive in your thoughts. But Renee, I'll let you um, kind of share a little bit about how you and the pension fund industry are really gonna think about how you, you know, talking about behavioral change and actual ways of um, practice change that kind of Kelly began to allude to. Yeah, so, you know, one of the things we wonder um, about is, you know, how, um, how embedded um, the desire for structural and systemic change is within the kind of the investment offices or industry. Are we know that within the plan participants and with the, the trustees, um, I, I, I want, we wonder, you know, um, kind of if, if the structures kind of lend itself to the structural change that, that we see, that we want to see, um, and whether the, the competencies are there. And so that's something that we're really concerned about. Um, I think that for SEIU, I would say that we're, um, we're trying to practice this um, um, life, you know, like we've committed um, for the past six years um, on, on diversity and human capital. And, um, you know, and we have tried to implement and practice this by, by going large and trying to, uh, you know, really look at how we create structural change to, to address, you know, systemic issues, um, um, specifically around um, diversity and equity and some around, around human capital. And, you know, we think that we are making a, a difference. We believe that we're making a difference. <laughs> um, but when you get have statistics like you know forty percent of of boards are not monitoring you know diversity statistics, um, um, uh, you know that causes concern, um, and thus that's why you know we have to have the type of kind of structural and systemic um, approach to these issues. Um, you know, that's the only thing that's going to create the type of change. And we have to have the large asset owners weigh in. And I, my favorite saying the shareholder season is that intent does not equal impact. And so one of the things that we saw, you know, last summer was a lot of organizations who made um, a lot of commitments and promises that they were and have not been able to execute on. And you know, like, no one's here for that. We have to create structural change that is sustainable because these issues are material and they're not going away. And so that's just one example, I think, that you know, I just like to bring up. Um, in terms of my book, my book title would probably be something like um, From the Streets to the Sweets or something like that. <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> is that, is oh, that, oh, now I'm in the C suites, kind of like that. Yeah. <laughs> like that. So, so I guess that's a that's an autobiography. That's an autobiography. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we'll, we'll figure out who's going to be cast to pay you to play you in biopic. Um, Kelly, your book title be Kelly. You might be muted. You're on so, mute, Kelly. I got it. So my book title is actually going to be Impact Investing. Because I actually okay. think what we're trying to do is impact investing. Not uh -huh. impact investing, but we need to impact investing. Uh, and that's the title of the, of the, of the next book. Because, and I think that these two books are are feeder books to my book on impact investing because you all are trying to impact investing in the way that we invest. That's great. I want to, uh, Kelly, I want to pick up on something that you said, um, and maybe this is the fourth book in the series after impact investing. Um, and I think the title of the book is Risky Business. I want yes. uh, you guys to write a book <laughs> about uh, reframing risk and return because I think we've got it wrong and this is all kind of leading up to that. Can I, I jump love in for it. a second, Monique? The original title of the book is anyone who's written a book knows you don't control the title of the publisher. <laughs> the, the initial title of our book was actually Imprudent Risk. So, uh, yeah. yes, it's all about risk. 
And Jim, what would be your next book? Yeah, I, I've written five or six books. I think I'm done with books. Uh, <laughs> but I do have a couple of articles in mind. One <laughs> is something that I've, talk, I've thought about for six months, haven't done anything on, but I've got a title for it. And the good thing about writing an article is you actually can control the title. It's Common Ownership and the Ownership of the Commons. And if people are familiar <laughs> with the debate in the SEC and the legal issues of common ownership, I think it's a big deal. Um, in, in the Biden administration, it's sort of not taken first place, but clearly under Trump and from the right, it was, it was not going away. That said, I think there's some really real and interesting issues there and did relate actually to one of the questions or a couple about universal ownership, not gonna go into that now, but it does play on that. And the, and the issue of course, what is the ownership of the commons? The other thing I'm really interested in, it's not something I'm writing, but it's something I follow and might want to write about is a number of projects, which again, talk about impacts, but it talk about, it's the quantification of externality impacts of product and service creation right down the supply chain line in terms of what that means uh, for the functioning of a broader economy around suboptimal or, or non-suboptimal performance. And I think there's some really interesting work that has just begun on that in a very serious way. It's a huge project, but it's uh, it's interesting stuff. So no books. <laughs> Carrie, what would your book title be? Ooh, uh, tough. My daughter is very into graphic novels right now. So I think I would take that tact and it would be something like, what's your system? Hmm. I like it. And for those who are wondering what my book title would be, I actually have a manuscript drafted and the children's book <laughs> title, my son is going to be two on Saturday, is Are You My Cutie Patootie? So that said, um, Bill, Jim, John, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. We have captured all of the questions and comments in the, in the chat. Apologies that we couldn't you see the time is tight and such brilliance was here. So we wanted to let, have a chance to, sh to share, but we will maybe address them directly to you, maybe in a blog post later as a, as a collective. And we'll try to make sure that um, we do continue to engage in these topics because I think it's important and this is I think we just have fun. I think we just lost Monique, but I think she was just saying thank you to everybody for joining us and to once again to SoCap for hosting all the discussants, uh, attendees really means a lot, guys. So thank you. <laughs>